Well, welcome to Association Chat, an online discussion where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with trailblazers and thought leaders alike to join up in this online home for the association community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalian. And first of all, I want to say a big thank you to our visionary Voyager sponsor, Big Red M. They are the go-to association growth partners offering consulting, sales, research, and now publishing services to, yes, their support helps make this podcast and the upcoming Association Chat Road Trip to ASE Annual possible. So thank you for that. Joining us today is Jeff DeCanya, a thought leader in the association community, a friend, a mentor, uh, and he is going to discuss his series, The Three Stewardship Imperatives of Fit for Purpose Association Boards. And Jeff's going to shed light on why he wrote this impactful, powerful series and what he hopes association leaders will take away from it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring Jeff up. Welcome to the Association Chat Podcast, Jeff. Thanks very much, Kiki. It's a pleasure to join you again after a while. So I'm very glad to be back and very excited to chat with you today. Yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, I um, so you're always doing something fascinating and you actually were building up um, to this point. You were talking about the work that you were doing on this and really lining up, you know, who you were talking with and when and how things were going to roll out. And so I'm excited because we got here I had technical difficulties, like I, my computer died on me, and then and then there was like travel, and so here you are, here we are, and we get the chance to talk about this really important topic, which I have to say, um, looking at this series, I don't know, I've known you for quite a few years now, and I don't know that I've ever uh, known you to not put a lot of thought and effort and energy into the work that you do. So I think that it's no surprise to see that this series is, I will use the word robust, <laughs> just to make you laugh. But it was like, um, it is a really powerful series and there's a lot to it. And so let's get started with why. Why did you write the three stewardship imperatives for Fit for Purpose Association Boards? Okay. What impact do you hope that it will have? We're in a, a difficult place, I think, in mm -hmm. our in our history. What is it we're going to do? How are we going to persuade boards across our community to tackle this challenge of becoming fit for purpose? Mm -hmm. Or another way that I like to say it is, you know, association boards must become more. So how will they become more? And um, I know we'll talk about the duty of foresight later, as you also know, this is the 10 year milestone for me of coining the term, the duty of foresight that I did and wrote an article in first associations in 2014. So all the work that I've been doing since the beginning of the year in thinking about this, um, I in earlier this year in April and May, I wrote a two-part series on why the duty of foresight remains a radical idea 10 years later. And thinking about writing that got me down the pathway of asking the question, what is it? What, what are, what's a way that I could communicate to association boards, to CEOs, to everyone who's working with association boards? To, to clarify for them, you know, what are three imperatives that they need to embrace to take everything else that I've been working on for the last few, several years in terms of board's core convictions and habits of mind and to make it, you know, not simple because it's not simple, right? But to mm -hmm, make it right. as straightforward as possible to say, these are the three imperatives that you've got to embrace to start down this pathway of becoming fit for purpose. And so that's what goes into this three-part series of imperatives. I know we're gonna talk about them today. Uh, and, and the impact is I hope it will start conversations and I hope it will move people mm -hmm. to begin to recognize, you know, whether it's through the conversation or whether it's through reading uh, what I wrote or through this discussion we're having today, I hope that what it will do is it will it will spark something in people to say, okay, We've got to start really talking about what this means for our board, for our association, for our stakeholders, and really most importantly, and this is you know a theme that I imagine will come up throughout our discussion, for our successors. Like we've really got to start focusing on how we're going to leave 
our organizations, our community, our industries, professions, fields better than how we found them, if we can, for those who will follow us, because um, we have a responsibility to our successors. And nowhere does that exist more intently uh, and more uh, significantly than in what boards need to be doing uh, starting right away. So that's the reason why, and that's my hope for how this will um, influence our conversations for the rest of this year and, and going forward. Well, and I think, you know, as as I think is typical for you, um, because along with being the association contrarian, um, I, the, the whole idea of being principled in your approach and really um, these ideals that um, that you identify for for boards and for for people who are taking on those roles and responsibilities. I think that's something that has been consistent. That's sort of a, a through line for you in all of the work that you do is like identifying these 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 ideals. And and that's one of the things that I've also thought over the years. And this is not the question yet, but I'm just saying like this is not this is something that I think has been one of the biggest challenges is because what I what I think is valiant in what you try to do here is that you're trying to educate and teach and lift people um, and and to get people to the point where they need to be to do the things that they need to do. Um, but it's hard and and the lift, the idea that it's going to get across, it, it's like to make those jumps to say this is, the concept here is here's the education. I want to teach you about how this, this works. You're going to apply it and then you're going to teach this and and have this carry on. It's just, you know, I want it to be true. And I also see the challenge in it. And so Mm -hmm. it's, I think that it is a valiant effort. I also think that it's, especially in a, in an age where people are so distracted by every single thing, um, especially the phones in their pockets and all of the stuff. Um, I think that it's really perfect that the first imperative that you write about is attention as responsibility. So uh, what does that mean? Let's talk about that. What does attention as responsibility mean? Uh, what implications does it have for board work? Yeah. So just before I respond to the question specifically, I just want to comment on on what you were saying leading in because you know I think that I, I appreciate what you're saying. And yes, I mean I, I I've always said that my career um, in associations, which is now in total, you know, I'm now in my 33rd year and 23 year this 23rd year of consulting, uh, and particularly the consulting part of it has always had a sort of Sisyphean feel for me. Like I'm constantly pushing a boulder uphill. I was doing that when I was doing innovation work for the first 15 years. And, and since I've been doing this work around boards and, and I don't mean that to sort of, you know, um, uh, make myself seem more important or, or barter myself. Mm -hmm. It's, I'm something I'm saying because I know it's, it's difficult to challenge the orthodoxy, which is what I do in everything that I write to, um, encourage people to, see the orthodoxy to recognize and then shift their thinking. And I, I, I know we'll talk about that more specifically in a moment, but um, so yes, so it's, it's none of it is easy, but here's the reason why I persist. Here's the reason why I continue. There's really two reasons. One, I think the, um, the last, um, well, really since the beginning of this decade, since the, since the pandemic became, um, you know, the, the, the centerpiece, the focus of our lives, for me, I felt like it was a reckoning, you know, with what is it we need to be doing differently in this decade versus what I was telling associations to be doing in the previous decade, because that was really, I think, and uh, I said at the time, and I'll say it again, it was an early warning to us mm-hmm. for the rest of this decade. It was a wake-up call. It should have been. So where we are now in 2024 is in many ways very clearly a product of what's happened in these last 1,600 plus days since the start of this decade. And I think the um, the second thing is what I'm describing is hard, but it, it we really have no choice. Like yeah. the dynamics of the environment in which we're operating demand something more of us. It demands that boards set a higher standard of stewardship, governing, and foresight. And so it's not as if what we're talking about is optional. We just can't continue down the same pathway 
that we've been on for years and decades, and in the case of boards, probably to some extent centuries. We've got to begin to make a break with those practices that have proven themselves to be remarkably ineffective um, because I've been having this conversation with people uh, recently, you know, in a couple of different places. As I mentioned, this is now year 23 for me as a consultant, year 33 in the community. And we are having the same discussions about the same problems yeah. on boards that we had when I started, right? And at some point, that's got to end. We've got to get past, you know, yeah. this dynamic of repeating the same problems and the same issues and move these conversations forward into different places. And so, yes, it's incredibly challenging and not everyone will want to tackle it and will be okay with just doing what they do. But as I see it for boards today, and I promise you I'm going to answer your question in a moment, I see it as really it's three options for boards, for, for all of us really, but today we're talking about boards, so I'll put it in that context. For them, looking ahead to mm -hmm. the rest of this decade and to the 2030s, considering all the issues that are in play right now, there are three options. Do nothing. Do something. Do everything you can. Those are the only three choices. I see do nothing as an impossibility for us to accept. Do something, you know, why, why would we do just something and then hope everything else works out? The only choice that I see as viable is do everything we can. And so that's what I'm going to try to do for as long as I'm doing this work. And um, I hope others will, will follow in that area. So let's talk about your question, attention as responsibility. So as I mentioned, I was thinking a lot about how could we clarify what this is all about and what boards and CEOs and staff partners and others need to talk about to get started down this pathway. And as you point out, one of the biggest reasons why this will be a struggle, why it is a struggle, is because people are so distracted. Mm -hmm. um, their attention is fragmented. Um, it's not just their phones, but it's all the inputs that they have to confront today. And everyone's brains have been rewired to some extent in a um, you know fast uh, fast moving internet based world with lots and lots of inputs and constantly having to be on and never turning off and you know sleeplessness and the whole nine yards. But what we have to realize is that when we take on a board role or really any role that is um, you know we have to make hard decisions. But again, we're talking about board say when you're taking on a board role for an association, you are accepting responsibility for that organization you're accepting responsibility for its stakeholders and for its successors so attention well, as as if responsibility they, if they do though if they do right i mean they're supposed well, to <laughs> that well that's that to me that is that is baked into the acceptance of that of that yeah. offer and if it's not then why are you doing this why why you know i know i, I, I hope know. that people are not telling no. me the reason why they want to be on the board is is um is because they get to go to meetings or, you know, they get a ribbon or they get fed it. Because it looks they get, good. You know, they get, right. they get dinner or they, you know, they put on their resume. And I don't right. have a problem with people having self-interested reasons for being on boards. But the only right. way that that self-interest is honored is by fulfilling the the, um, the, the interests of others, the responsibilities right. and duties of, you know, toward others. Right. And so attention as responsibility, everyone's got to ask that question of themselves. You know, how am I directing my attention? How is the board directing its, its attention? Um, and toward what work? And, uh, and, and are we doing it well? And are we removing things, you know, from a board attention that don't need to be there because the board needs to use its attention as a resource, but it also needs to interact with the larger questions, which is, you know, how do we interface with a larger world of challenges and problems? I just written an article for associations now on, on the poly crisis. And, you know, that that's the environment in which we're operating. So the implications of that for board work um, begin even before people are seated on boards and how they how they serve on boards and what they are doing, you know, what work we're asking to take on while they are on boards and and for everyone at that table to recognize that attention as responsibility is a translation of what it was that brought them there in the first place into uh, how they serve, how they act, how they make decisions, how they perform, and whether or not they are contributing to that board becoming fit for purpose, to you know becoming more 
so that it can navigate, it can steward the organization into the future. Wow. I mean, I, I think that um, obviously the idea that just paying attention as part of your duty, that that you're accepting that responsibility um, is so critical. And yet even that, I think, is a huge hurdle to get past and and I'll say, I mean, I know it's beyond the technology of it. I know it's beyond the simplicity of like, oh, wow, we have these distractions and that it's actually about, you know, really pay attention to what's happening and your role in it and the way that what's happening in the industry and the duties you have as you're sitting at this table, virtual or in person, you know, like the responsibility that you have as as a member of the board for whatever organization that you happen to be a member of the board for. And yet I think that that, that I think we would win so much just by that alone. I think if we stopped even here, that would be a huge win just to get the attention, but there's so much more to this. Like I totally hear what you're saying. I, it, if it were as, as simple as asking people just to simply pay attention, then I think we could probably do it a little differently. What I, what I really want people to take away from this is to recognize that that really intrinsic and intimate connection between what they are using their attention for and their responsibility to the organization, right? And, and to sort of see those two things as not different, right. but as the same thing, right? Yes. And so, and so, so. You know, we could say to people, you know, keep your focus on this while you're in the room and that sort of thing. But right. it's it's beyond when you're sitting in the room with people or when you're on a Zoom meeting, right? It's always recognizing that your um, your attention, whether it's your attention as a resource or whether it's your attention as you interface with a larger world, as you pursue learning, as you go about the the work of um, understanding, um, sort of making sense of things, making meaning, and making decisions that where your attention has to be is a is a reflection of how you see your responsibility to the organization. And when you are not effectively using and effectively directing the individual and collective attention of directors and officers on what's important to the organization, then they are, it works both ways. Either they're not fulfilling their responsibility or we are undermining their ability to fulfill their responsibility. So we've got to sort of help everyone look at it through the larger perspective of that really intimate connection that exists between attention and responsibility in, in an environment like this one. I mean, I, I see that though. And I think it's attention, it's responsibility and it's care. It's care. You're caring for that response. You're caring for that role. Simply put, I think that just the attention part, like just getting people to, to like, understand before they even, you know, begin to consider the decisions that they're making and the conversations that they're en entering into, just to give that, it's really like care, right? Um, to the role, to what they're doing. How does this imperative support exercising care and limiting vulnerability? You mentioned earlier uh, the importance of care mm -hmm. and, and we agree on that. And I think that the problem that I see is that in board rooms, in board conversations, in the way we just talk about boards, um, care is primarily expressed as a legal concept. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same, um, the duty of care is about, mm -hmm. you know, exercising the same prudent judgment that any other person would do, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and the problem is that exercising care really has to be about recognizing that what's happening now in our environment uh, is placing more and more actual human beings at risk, putting them in harm's way. And someone's got to care about that. Someone's got to worry about that. And while certainly we expect that governments will care about that, it can't be limited to just governments working on that. Uh, it has to be other kinds of organizations and certainly other kinds of nonprofits will do that as well. But w most of the resources that exist in the nonprofit sector exist in um, a relatively small number or comparatively small number of organizations because there's lots of nonprofits that are incredibly under-resourced. So, so it's, you know, it's foundations and, you know, maybe academic institutions. And then there's associations that are among 
you know, a lot of them are among the most resourced organizations. So we've got to be putting our attention on how can we exercise care to safeguard, you know, um, our stakeholders and successors to the greatest possible extent. And and it's their vulnerability that's it, that is in play here, that, that is an issue. But it's also the vulnerability of those making decisions because, you know, this is hard as we've talked about. Um, it's going to bring up, um, a, you know, an emotional and affective component for those mm -hmm. who are serving on boards to have to undertake these kinds of responsibilities. That's what the job is now. It's not the it's not the job of being on a board in 1980 or 1990 or even 2000. It's the job of being on a board in 2024 is a lot harder, a lot more difficult, and it's going to make people feel vulnerable. And what we have to try to help them do is recognize that. Adaptation is renewal is not just about their organizations, but about them as well. Like they mm -hmm. can adapt, they must adapt themselves and in the process renew themselves uh, as people serving, you know, on boards. Yeah.